Hi everyone. This is Miriam Naime from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging Webinar. The Smart Charging Webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute is the national institute in the UK for data science and AI. And one of the objectives of the Institute is to apply data science method to help with real world problems, such as what we are doing at the Vigil Integration Group, where we are supporting the decarbonization of electricity and transport infrastructure. On this webinar, we've had talks uh, from companies uh, telling us about their activities on smart charging, but also on regional and national activities uh, to roll out charging infrastructure, such as we had speakers from California, from Denmark, and today we're hosting speakers from Quebec. We also had talks on cybersecurity, and uh, we had talks on communication protocols for electric vehicles. You can find the slides on our landing page, in addition to uh, information on future events. Also, all the recordings are made available on our YouTube playlist. I briefly wanted to talk about uh, a recent uh, open access paper we collaborated with, uh, with a colleague from Denmark at DTU. And this is a graph from that paper where we are seeing the several entities involved in the um, uh, electric vehicle ecosystem. Um, in the paper, we briefly talk about their role right now and in the future, what their role could be. We also talk about the information and control objects exchange. Now, I want to make two points uh, out of this paper where we review some communication protocols. First is that uh, there is a lot of data exchanged between these two entities. So it is important that they are all talking one or very few languages. Otherwise, if uh, different entities and different equipments are talking several languages, then we can move to a future where we have a fragmented electric vehicle infrastructure and we want to avoid that. The second point is about privacy and cybersecurity. Not just control objects uh, are, are involved, such as the transport and energy, but also information about the users. Users need to, they need to ensure that if they wake up, for example, then have um, a car that's ready for them and meet their driving needs. And so uh, we already talked about cybersecurity aspects and we will do so for the rest of July. Now, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm really for today to hear about uh, Quebec's electric vehicle and smart charging activities and uh, our speakers have extensive technical and energy backgrounds and right now they are involved in electric vehicle projects. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to give the presentation to Jean-Luc, Jean-Pierre and Guillaume. I, uh, I know you're on, on mute. One second, please. So is... Uh, I'm unable to see Guillaume anymore for some reason. Jean-Luc, are you able to speak? Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, this is Jean-Pierre Coteau. Apologies about this. Yeah. No problem. I can as well start the video if you want. I don't mind. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
after you can share your screen now, I think, if you wanted to start with the presentation. Good. I will share my screen. Please confirm that you can see it. Yeah. Good. Uh, so my name is Jean-Pierre Croteau, and uh, I'll be doing the, the, the first part of the presentation with my colleague, uh, Jean-Luc Dupré. We are both employees at Hydro-Quebec, uh, and I'm actually now uh, uh, been lent to the company uh, ELO. So you'll, you'll get some more information as we, uh, we go through the presentation. So I'll move through this uh, a bit more quickly, simply because what we're trying to show you today is a very quick overview of Hydro-Quebec, so that we can give Guillaume most of the time to talk about the project that we did uh, with him. So presentation on Hydro-Quebec, very quickly on the energy system. What you need to, uh, to be aware of is uh, Hydro-Quebec's power is mostly uh, hydroelectric power. So we are at more than 99% uh, renewable energy with hydro dams in the north of the province. If you want to look into a bit more details, what exactly is Hydro-Quebec? We are Canada's largest electric utility. Uh, we have 36,700 megawatts of hydropower, which is about 50% of the overall uh, Canadian total. Uh, as of end of last year, about 20,000 employees. We have 62 hydroelectric generating stations and more than 260,000 kilometers of transmission lines. And the reason for it is that as you'll see on the map on the right, is most of the production is happening uh, in the north of Quebec and the population actually lives mostly in the south. So a lot of transmission line to bring all of this power down south. We are a Crown corporation, 100% owned by the Quebec government. And then you have some stats to be able to compare a bit Quebec versus the UK. So we are about uh, uh, seven times less population in the UK, but we have about seven times more uh, land area. Uh, similarly, much less vehicles uh, and much less electric vehicles, though our uh, ratio, the, the proportion of electric vehicles in, in Quebec is extremely high. And Jean-Luc will be able to show you a bit uh, why. Similarly, you can look at the, uh, the price index that we have for electricity. Hydro-Quebec provides the, uh, the cheapest electricity in North America. So you see here a uh, 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 price index where we compare Montreal as the 100%, and then you can see the different ratios. So when you move to the US, it's not, it's not uncommon to see uh, big cities in the US have electric pricing that are four times or close to five times higher than what we see in Montreal. To be able to understand a bit more about the project that we did, you need to understand uh, other particularities about, uh, about Quebec and the power consumption. Uh, here on the graph, as you can see on the left, a, a occurrences of different peaks through the year. These are the peaks of the distributor, so it's not the peak of the overall province, but probably of a, a good 80% of what's happening in the province of Quebec. So on the left, you can easily see the seasonality where the, the bigger peaks will be happening during the winter and the lower peaks during the summer. If you were to stack them in, in, in a decreasing order, then you can see the, uh, the, the frequency of those peaks happening during the year. So you can tell that we, we always have some large peaks, but similar to, uh, to other utilities, uh, our, our, um, our consumption in, during the year is not stable. We have a lot of high peaks and a lot of pretty deep valleys. And in Quebec, the, the key point because of that is that uh, our, our province is defined by electrical heating. So I was looking at the seasonal peaks in the previous slides. Here you can see the peaks for the day of uh, January 22nd of this year. Um, in Quebec, you usually get a peak uh, between six and nine in the morning, and then between four and eight in the afternoon. And these are tied directly to heating. Uh, the, the consumption of electricity in a household in Quebec is about 54% for heating and AC, 20% for hot water. Then you get appliances, lighting, and, and other devices. But it's a very, a very particular part of Quebec, uh, particular point of Quebec that we have uh, electrical heating. You saw the low pricing that we have. And what this creates is a, a, is a pretty big demand on our network early in the morning and in the evening when people come back from work. That's really, really just a quick view of, of what we have in Quebec. I'll pass the, uh, the, the discussion points now to, uh, to Jean-Luc. We'll be able to talk to you a bit more about EVs in Quebec. Yes. 
Hello to all. Do, do you hear me? Yeah, Hello? we can hear you, Jean Luc. Okay, okay. So uh, I will give you some information about EVs in Quebec and uh, our public charging network. So next slide, please. Uh, yes. So roughly, um, we have we have about uh, fifty percent of the number of vehicles in in Canada. Uh, but in fact, we are only 25% in Quebec, there is only 25% of the Canadian population. So it means that we have, we have the province which have the most uh, uh, electrical vehicles. So next, next, yes. So right, right now we have uh, about uh, 70,000 uh, uh, EVs, and we are target, targeting at uh, the end of uh, 20 uh, of this year, so 100,000 uh, EVs, and uh, by 30, 1 million of EVs. So in order to, to, to allow the people to, to charge uh, at, when they are out of home, uh, we we have to install fast charging station, and so we forecast to to install uh, one thousand and six hundred uh, by twenty seven. Next one. So we have often this question: to what degree does temperature impact on EV range? So it has a quite a, a big impact. So uh, the result here is uh, the result. Uh, coming from a Charge the North project. Uh, well, you can see that um, the rated range of a vehicle usually is, uh, is at, uh, at uh, between 10 and 15 degrees. But uh, during the winter, so at low temperatures, uh, you can reduce the range of uh, about 40 to uh, 60%. Uh, but there is also an impact uh, during the summer when the temperature is high. You may reduce also the, the range of the, of the EVs. Uh, but at the same time, it's possible to use EVs during the winter in Quebec, uh, thanks to the uh, public charging station that we are installing. So next one. So. What is also the impact of uh, charging uh, of EVs at home? Uh, as you, you, may, you may know, most of the charging is performed at, uh, at home. And uh, here is the result of a study that we, we did, some measurement that we did uh, at uh, about uh, 500 uh, charging station at home. So level two charging station at home. And we can see that the, the the main impact during the power peak that we have between uh, four and, uh, and eight in, in, the, in the evening is about at six o'clock. And uh, it means that we, will have, we have an impact of 0 0.7 kilowatt per vehicles. So it means that if we have on this, uh, without any uh, time of use rate, uh, without uh, controlling the, the charging station at home. So it means that with 1 million of EVs, we will have less than 2% additional power peak demand uh, in Quebec. Next one. So we have also for public charging uh, network, we have some wi winter challenge for sure. We have quite a, a lot of snow some, some days. Uh, so sometimes it's quite difficult to, to access uh, the, the charging station. Uh, but uh, on, we have also a different case than in Europe. It means that uh, the cable is, uh, is always at the charging station. It's not the, the owner of the EVs who bring the, the cable. So we have some the cable at, uh, attached to the charging station. And so we need uh, we need some uh, some uh, equipment to manage the cable so that it does not stay uh, on the ground and uh, will be broken by the snow snowblower uh, machine. Next one, please. So the electric circuit is the is the charging public charging network that 
belongs to uh, Hydro-Québec. It is the first and largest public charging network in Canada. So now it's more than eight, eight years old. Uh, we, we are some partners. The partners are the, the owner of the land where we install the, the charging station. And now we have more than 300 uh, partners and we have uh, more than 2,500 uh, charging stations, including more than uh, 300 uh, fast charging stations. We have about uh, 60,000 uh, members. That means quite all the EVs owners belongs to electric service. Next one. So we have, we have three types of uh, charging station. We have level two charging station, and we have this level two charging station with a possibility to have a curbside uh, charging station. This is a specific charging station that we designed uh, together with, uh, with a supplier, and which is now uh, also implementing install, which is also, um, uh, used uh, by New York. Uh, so, and we have also the main one, the fast charging station. We have uh, more than 350 kilowatt charging station. And next month, uh, no, in fact, this month, we will start uh, installing 100 kilowatt charging station. So, we have uh, what we call super station, that means that it's uh, four fast charging station of uh, right now uh, 50 kilowatts. But in fact, what we do is we have a, a standardized uh, uh, system. We have all the same equipment everywhere. We use either uh, Add Energy charging station or ABB1. But uh, the civil works are scalable, it's a uh, modular setup. And it's quite easy to, to install in less than one week. We can install this uh, uh, four charging station. And it's also uh, one of the aim is that can be seen easily by the, by the EV drivers. So it's uh, really scalable. Sometimes we, we may install only one or two charging station with or without uh, canopy. So this is the way we install this uh, fast charging station. What is the, why do we install a fast charging station? We have a, a business case. Uh, it's a rate-based financing. That means that the more we install fast charging station, the more people uh, have EVs. And so the more they, ch they charge at home or at the, public charging station, and so the more Hydro-Québec uh, sell electricity. So with the money that we get, that we get from, uh, from, this, uh, from the, the selling of this electricity, we can install more charging station. So it's a self-supporting project. Next one, yes. So, Jean-Pierre. Yeah, so we, we talked quickly uh, about uh, Hydro-Quebec and who we are and what we do. And Jean-Luc just presented what the, the Circuit Electric is and what the challenges and the differences we have with respect to EVs in Quebec. Now, what, we need to, what you need to understand also is that Hydro-Quebec has uh, three main R&D facilities. We have the IREP, Institut de Recherche en Électricité du Québec, which is the largest research institute of its kind in North America. We have the LTE, which is a division of IREP. It's a, a technologies lab where they test what our customers are going to be doing with energy. And we have the Center of Excellence in Transportation, Electrification, and Energy Storage. So with those three R&D facilities, we are uh, investing uh, over $110 million in R&D every year, which is tied to Hydro Quebec. So it's, uh, it, it's a, a, pre a pretty large amount of money that we invest in anything that has to deal with energy. It's not limited to, uh, to electrification of transport. One of the projects that came out uh, from, from this R&D activity is ELO. ELO is, uh, is a company where I work now. So I'm an Hydro-Quebec employee, but I am, I have, I've been uh, uh, basically rented out to Hydro-Quebec for, uh, for a few years to help its uh, startup. So ELO 
is going to be a, uh, a, uh, a subsidiary of Hydro-Quebec and is going to be looking at the energy transition of both our residential and commercial institutional industrial customers. And you'll notice that whether you're looking on the left side of the slide or the right side of the slide, you, you'll notice that there's often the same types of projects that show up. And it's projects that you probably are, are very familiar with if you've been following the energy transition and what's happening uh, nowadays in the world. So we have launched a, a, a pilot project with a thousand customers this winter for a connected home solution. We will be launching the commercial version of the connected home solution by the end of, of this year. And then we have more and more projects that would be added to it. So I just wanted to, to mention that we do, uh, we do a lot of research and then we execute on a lot of those research that are being done in different formats. And tied to this, Jean-Luc, if you want. We also support public transit uh, transportation. Uh, so for example, we, we, we finance the electrification of a, a new commuter train here in Montreal. It's a lot of money, but uh, Adro Quebec is uh, given in order to electrify the the train, but we also do some. Uh, we also support some of the uh, organization, uh, like uh, uh, smaller uh, fleet of uh, autobus. Um, so, for example, we did uh, an audit uh, for autobus Laval uh, that will be that will be presented by uh, by Guillaume. Uh, so, and we during the audit, we we saw that uh, there was a uh, an increase of the maximum power demand due to electric uh, buses. Uh, it was in Dece December 17, and uh, it has quite a big impact on the on, on the cost of uh, of, uh, of electricity for this organization, uh, because the cost is depending not only on the uh, energy consumption but also on the power demand. This is the way uh, rates. Uh, are defined in Quebec and I think everywhere in, in the world. So as they increase the power demand, the, the bill of electricity increase and it, it, incre it has quite a, a big impact. So that's why we, we decided to, to, make a, to make a project in order to, to manage this uh, power demand. And uh, we define, uh, I do Quebec define the scope of the project and finance it and we were uh, uh, help by uh, other organizations. So now uh, Guillaume will present you uh, this, uh, this project. Great, thanks Jean-Luc. Um, I don't know if you can, if you can hear me properly. Um, I'm going to try to take over and share my screen right now. Um, it's okay, we'll listen to you. So I'm sharing my screen. I hope everyone is able to see it. Um, so my name is Guillaume Fournier. I'm a professional engineer. Um, I'm a program manager at the Innovative Vehicle Institute in the vicinity of Montreal. Uh, and I'm going to discuss today a project that I've been working on along with Hydro Quebec, um, uh, which is a smart peak shaving charge manager for an electric school bus fleet. That's a, Pretty, that's a mouthful. Um, full disclaimer up front: uh, the project is in, uh, the project implementation is completed, but the activation is not. Uh, what that means is that everything is in place to activate it, but performance has not been uh, assessed as of yet. So take everything that is in the presentation with a grain of salt. Okay. So who is IVI? Uh, the Innovative Vehicle Institute is a nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission is to promote the development of advanced transportation, especially uh, electric, autonomous, and connected vehicles. We aim at helping small and medium businesses create uh, innovations in these fields. The project I'm going to talk about has been sponsored by the government of Quebec through the Innové Consortium and also by Hydro-Quebec. Uh, we also had two partners in the, pro in the project, uh, Autobus Laval, uh, which Jean-Luc talked a bit earlier. Uh, they are a bus operator around Quebec City. Uh, they operate coach and school buses, uh, both diesel and electric. Uh, they have a, a small fleet of electric vehicles. They have seven uh, electric buses. 
Uh, these buses come from the Lion Electric Company, which is also a partner in the project. Uh, they are an electric school bus and also an electric truck manufacturer. And all participants are based in Quebec. So the problem that we were trying to address with this project is the multiple occurrences of excessive power peaks at uh, Autobus Laval's location, the operator. Um, the peaks occur when uh, the block eaters for the diesel buses were manually activated while the electric buses were charging. These excessive peaks resulted in a significant cost increase for them. So we were trying to address that. Um, let's look at the main loads at the operator's location. They have uh, three main loads I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, the block heaters. Um, they have 115 diesel bus buses or so. And they're parked at the depot and they're pretty much all fitted with block heaters. Um, the block heaters are installed on the diesel buses because we have a uh, cold uh, winter and we wanna make sure that the buses are going to be um, available in the morning. So whenever a, um, a, a, a driver uh, parks at the depot, he will typically plug uh, its block eater into a circuit, an electric circuit. Um, the block eaters are automatically enabled when the temperature is below minus 10 degrees C between uh, 2 and 4 a.m. So that's what you're seeing right there on the screen. Um, the combined power of all the diesel bus block eaters is around 97 kilowatts. Uh, there's also a manual bypass. I said uh, it's pretty much automatic, but uh, there's a manual bypass that is accessible and it is sometimes used. The second load I want to talk about uh, is the charging station, uh, which I will call EVSCs in the following of the presentation. Um, they have uh, seven electric buses and each bus has its own assigned EVSC. Uh, each bus can be charged at around a maximum of 16.6 kilowatt. Uh, this is a level two charging station uh, uh, and it uh, outputs 80 amps at 208 volts. So that's the reason why the 16.6 kilowatt. Um, the electric buses are systematically plugged in their EVSC whenever they are parked at the depot and each bus uh, has its own schedule and it can vary uh, greatly, uh, specifically in the summer. Uh, in, in the during the school year, it's pretty much uh, static. Um, so uh, every day is, every weekday is pretty much the same because the, the trips are the same. But in the summer, uh, they do transports for um, summer camps and stuff like that. So uh, it can vary uh, a lot more in the, in the summer. So what you see here, uh, is data from a school day with uh, seven buses. Uh, you can see that the buses are leaving at about seven in the morning for uh, to pick up kids and they're coming back at around nine. Uh, not all of the buses, but some of them are leaving at 11 for lunch and coming back at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, and at three, uh, all of the buses are leaving again uh, and they're back at five. Um, and then they charge and they can, the, the charging process for all the buses is pretty much done by, by midnight. And what you see remaining here is like the trickle charging, uh, mainly to keep the batteries at temperature in the winter. So uh, it was an, an approximation uh, at uh, minus 10 degrees C for a typical school day. The last load I want to talk about is the building. Uh, the building is heated using natural gas. Uh, however, um, the, the, the building electricity power demand is highly uh, correlated to outside temperature. Um, what you see on the right here uh, is a bunch of data points uh, and we use these data points to uh, perform a, a very, very rough estimate of the power consumption. So uh, what we, we decided to do with Hydro-Quebec is that we uh, estimate the, the power consumption at 50 kilowatt when the, temp the outside temperature is above seven degrees Celsius. And uh, it follows uh, linear regression uh, shown here whenever uh, the temperature is below uh, seven degrees C. For example, at minus 10 degrees C, the building power demand is around 97 kilowatt, which is 
ironically or surprisingly close to the block heaters. So when we look at the sum of all of these loads, uh, you have a block of energy here, uh, which is the building. You have your block heaters that are getting activated between two and four. Uh, and you have your bus, your bus EVSCs that are there. So the way the loads are activated makes for an, in, an interesting distribution, as you see. Uh, when everything goes as planned, the maximum power demand of the EVSCs is similar to the block heaters. Uh, however, uh, it does not always go as planned. Um, if the block heater circuits are manually engaged at a time where the electric buses are charging, the power demand on the building can uh, easily increase by 50%. Uh, this happened a couple of times uh, at the operator's location, and it's one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, have uh, to implement this project there. Uh, also, um, keep in mind that the number of block eaters connected can vary because the number of uh, elect uh, diesel electric uh, will vary. Uh, also, the number of uh, electric uh, vehicle will also vary uh, in the future. Uh, the schedule can change. And finally, most of the loads are highly correlated to temperature. So this changes all of these, uh, these load profiles. So the goal of the project uh, was to prevent the power peaks that I talked about and smooth the power as possible. Um, so we basically want to go from my artistic rendering here of the power profile to uh, uh, something that's flatter. Uh, by the way, we were precursors uh, of flattening the curve way before the COVID-19 came up. Um, you'll, you'll notice that um, uh, the energy stays the same, so the area under the curve uh, is pretty much the same. Uh, what we do is just move around the, the, the power distribution so we get a flatter uh, power profile. So by doing this, we're, de we're also decreasing the electricity costs because we're reducing the maximum power demand on the grid. Um, so it's, it's cheaper for the operator. Uh, it's also nice for Hydro-Quebec because it doesn't need to invest in bigger uh, local distribution equipment. Uh, the last goal, obviously, is to maintain the bus availability. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, no kids uh, would be uh, staying on the curbside. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure that all the trips are uh, done properly. The project location is in uh, the province of Quebec, Canada. Um, the, the operator is near Quebec City. And this is uh, like a 3D map of their, uh, an aerial view of their uh, location. So the buildings right here, uh, for now the seven electric buses are connected to their EVSCs right beside the building. Uh, there is two uh, diesel buses lines, um, uh, they're parked uh, as such. Um, each of these blue lines here represent an electric circuit. So I said that uh, the block heaters were automatically activated. Um, both of these circuits are identically controlled. Um, we could work on that and have alternating uh, circuits so we could half the, the, the power consumption of these block heaters. But uh, this is uh, not the purpose of this project right now. So, uh, but this is something that we could eventually do to uh, increase the, um, uh, the efficiency and reduce, uh, furthermore reduce the, the maximum power demand. Let's talk about the solution in vision to meet the goals of the project. Um, to be able to flatten the power profile, we want to control how much power is proposed to each of the buses through their EVSC. So what we want to do is we want to uh, speak, communicate with the charging station and propose a different uh, power value depending on our calculation. So instead of always proposing 16.6 .6 kilowatt to the vehicle, we want to modulate that uh, and that's, the pro that's what the, the, the optimizer is doing. So we decided to create a, a charge plan for the next 24 hours based on different information gathered from the different subsystems. Uh, 
Uh, our charge manager uh, is shown here along with the other subsystems. Um, so the, the, the information we're, get, we're, we're getting is uh, we're getting the bus schedules for, for each bus. Uh, we're also getting information from the utility. Uh, for example, a 24 hour power profile prediction and information from the smart meter. And we're also uh, discussing with the EVSCs uh, on site. So each EVSC is connected through Zigbee to a local bridge supplied by the EVSC manufacturer. Uh, this bridge communicates through a cellular network uh, to their backend, so the EVSC, the manufacturer's EVSC backend, and we have an API where we can uh, send and receive data um, through that backend. And finally, we're um, getting uh, information from the buses, uh, mainly the state of charge of each bus. Each bus is fitted with a cellular uh, modem. Uh, that is connected on the CAN bus of the vehicle, and each time a uh, state of charge, a new state of charge value is uh, advertised on the CAN bus, it will be sent through a cellular network to the fleet management backend, and we're also, we also have a mean to get the information to our optimizer. So let's look uh, at the different uh, data that we're getting. Uh, I said we were getting uh, information from a calendar. Uh, we're using uh, Google Calendar because it's free, because it's known to work, because it, it includes uh, recurrences and sharing abilities. It has a, a very well documented API and we did not want to reinvent the wheel. So each um, bus has its own calendar. Um, so what you see here is the uh, calendar for one of the bus. Um, each meeting, whoops, sorry, each meeting uh, is uh, comprised of uh, several information. There's a human readable description uh, that is not used by the system. Here they decided to uh, write the bus number and the circuit number. Um, the meeting time uh, is an indication to the system when the, the bus is expected to be unplugged. And the location of the meeting is used to register uh, the, the distance that is planned uh, to be traveled for this trip. So here we have a 21 kilometer um, um, trip that is uh, upcoming. Um, there are three uh, information pieces that we get from uh, Hydro-Quebec. Um, the first one comes from the smart meter. Uh, it's an energy accumulator in kilowatt hour that we receive every five minutes. Um, using this, we calculate the average power between these two data points. And then we use the average power to perform a control loop on the EVSC. Uh, so what I mean by that is that we calculate uh, through our optimizer a total power target for each interval. And we try to match it using this control loop. So. If, for example, the optimizer is expecting a 150 kilowatt power value for a specific interval, but only 100 kilowatt is being pulled from the grid, and we read that uh, through the average power, um, then the, the system will uh, automatically distribute the 50 kilowatt remaining between the different buses. And it goes both ways, uh, positive and negative. So the difference, um, between the, the, the target value calculated by the optimizer and the actual reading can be caused uh, by, for example, unexpected loads on the building or by a bus that's not consuming the power proposed, etc. The second uh, information we're getting uh, is the demand response event list. Uh, this is a list that contains upcoming events where the utility uh, is kindly requesting its customer to reduce their power consumption to a minimum. So they ask for this because they are foreseeing a peak demand on their network as uh, Jean-Luc Jean and Jean-Pierre were talking about. And that sometimes means that uh, they will need to buy energy from outside of the province, which is not, uh, uh, which is not great. Uh, there are financial incentives that are being offered for every kilowatt hour not consumed compared to your typical profile uh, under certain tariffs. 
uh, and it's a great way to save money, uh, money for the operator and also uh, save on equipment installation for the utility. And uh, third information is the power profile prediction of the building, including the block heaters, but uh, not including the charging stations. So uh, it's sent through a JSON file and uh, we get 96 values uh, of power uh, prediction. Each value represents a 15 minute interval for the, for the next 24 hours. Um, uh, and it's temperature compensated. So that's the reason why you see, like, let's say this is uh, now and it's 3 p.m. and we get this information. Uh, uh, the, temp the outside temperature is going to fall because the night is, uh, is coming. The, the, the building power consumption is going to increase. Between 2 and 4 a.m., your block heaters are going to uh, step in. And as soon as the sun rises, then the, temp the outside temperature is going to uh, increase. So the building uh, power is going to decrease. Uh, I talked already about the data that we're getting from the fleet management. So only one information is currently being pulled from each uh, electric vehicle, uh, the state of charge. Uh, other information is ready, but we're not using it for now. And there are no incoming messages to the bus. So no information that are, is coming from our cloud uh, to the vehicle for now. Data that we send to the AVSC is the current to propose to each bus. And data that we get from the EVSCs uh, is the instantaneous supply current. Um, of course, uh, we can propose, uh, let's say, uh, 80 amps, 80 amperes, uh, but it doesn't mean that the vehicle is going to take all of this. So uh, we get a reading of what is actually being consumed. We also have a voltage reading and an energy meter reading. Uh, and we also know if the vehicle is plugged or not. Uh, so uh, we know if, if the, we can charge uh, or not. I will now explain uh, how we create a charge plan for each bus. Uh, we use a multi-stage linear optimizer to do it. Uh, linear optimizer finds the best outcome or the best optimal solution given an expression to be maximized or minimized uh, under a set of constraints. Um, in layman's term, uh, it means that the optimizer will find the best charging plan given a target to minimize or maximize while respecting the constraints given. And we'll go into more details in the following slides. Uh, the output of each stage is a charge plan. So the charge plan is right here. Uh, more specifically, it is represented by seven arrays, uh, one per bus, and it's scalable, of course, of 96 power values um, to propose to each bus. Each square here represents a 15 minute interval and its value in kilowatt is the amount of power that is going to be offered for that bus for this interval. The charge plan covers the next 24 hours. So uh, let's talk about the different uh, stages real quick. Um, the stage one is the objective of, of stage one is to minimize the maximum power demand for the next 24 hours. So that's the main goal of the project. Uh, the constraints are pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, of course, the, the charge power cannot uh, exceed what we can do. So it must be between zero and 16.64 kilowatt. That's the amount of uh, power that we can uh, transfer between the EVSC and the bus. Uh, the charge is only allowed when the bus is plugged in. That makes sense. Um, the energy in a bus must be between its battery being completely empty to its battery being completely full. And uh, the energy in the buses must be sufficient to perform all trips. So at each moment that the trip is supposed to, be, to begin, uh, we have to make sure that the energy in the battery is sufficient. So then we have this intermediate step, which is not a linear optimizer computation step, but more of a matrix refactoring. So that's the reason why I called it stage 1.5. Uh, the objective is to find the maximum power available per interval. Uh, the objective is to compute for each interval the maximum power available 
that can be drawn without increasing the maximum power demand already registered for this billing cycle. So what that means is if this is the output of stage one uh, and each step here represent an interval, a power interval, and the power is the sum of all the proposed uh, power to all of the buses, um, we want to compute the maximum power that we can still work on once we have reached a certain power level. So whenever we reach this point here, there's uh, no, um, there's no uh, interesting, it's not interesting to force the system to follow the curve because we know we've already exceeded the maximum power demand and that the maximum power demand is here at that point. So we're creating energy pockets that are going to be used uh, uh, by the following stages. So the second stage, uh, the objective is to minimize the power demand on demand response events. So uh, remember these events are sent by Hydro-Quebec whenever they want their customers to um, uh, reduce their energy consumption between certain times. Uh, so that's what we do here. Uh, we, uh, we, during these events, we try to reduce the power consumption, the energy consumed uh, to a minimum. Uh, you'll notice that the energy that's been removed here has been transferred to the pocket that was, uh, that was uh, created from stage 1.5. So um, that's, that's the way it works. Um, Note also that the constraints for uh, this stage and the next uh, stages will always be the same. So there are gonna be all of the previous constraints from the different stages, the previous uh, different stages, and the result from the previous stage. Uh, stage number three, the objective is to maximize the time when the buses are ready for their next trip. Uh, so for each trip, for each bus, for the next 24 hours, calculate how long before the trip the bus is ready. Uh, basically, we list all the trips for all of the buses. Uh, we compute uh, how long before the trip uh, the bus is ready. Uh, and then we try to maximize the smallest time of this list. Uh, once this is done, uh, stage four and five are going to maximize the amount of energy. So we maximize the amount of time. We, now we want to try to maximize the amount of energy in the buses before each trip. So stage four um, is going to, uh, for all the different trips, it's going to uh, try to uh, maximize the exceeding energy uh, before each trip. So maximize the smallest number of this list. For example, if uh, for bus number one, trip number one, we have a 17 kilowatt hour uh, more than needed before the trip, uh, we're gonna list all of these exceeding energies and we're gonna try to maximize the smallest one. And the second step of this uh, energy maximization uh, is to do the same thing, but instead of maximizing the, the, the smallest number, we're gonna try to maximize the, the sum of all of these excessive energies. And finally, uh, the last um, stage is to minimize the power variation. So for the next 24 hours, minimize the variations of power, uh, of power offered to the vehicles uh, between two adjacent intervals. So it's probably unnecessary uh, because we have uh, 15 uh, minute intervals. So that's quite long, uh, but we wanted to avoid uh, going from full power to uh, zero power and, and so forth. Uh, the result of, of uh, a pass of the multi-stage optimizer is uh, a charge plan. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, a representation of uh, what it could look like. So um, what you see here is like the charge plan. Uh, the gray zone here is the power prediction for the building and the block heaters. Uh, it's not an actual representation, but it's uh, uh, 
like a, uh, simulations, if you will. Um, the black line here uh, that you see is the maximum power domain value. Uh, so you'll see that uh, at that point here, we needed to increase the maximum power because we were not able to reach the goals uh, without doing so. Uh, the different colors, uh, it's the, the current that's going to be uh, proposed to each vehicle. Uh, and in here, uh, you see that uh, there are no power being uh, proposed to the vehicles just because they're supposed to be uh, out on the road. Uh, this is another way to look at the charge plan. Uh, so this is just the, the, the current being proposed to each of the vehicles. Uh, this is uh, a way to look at the, um, the energy storage in the, in the batteries. Uh, so you see that the vehicle gets plugged in and it, it charges. Uh, at this point here, <clears throat> sorry, the, um, the little bump that you see there is a requirement for a trip. So the vehicle is uh, going to leave at that point and it's going to need 17.62 uh, kilowatt hour. Uh, so the energy is going to decrease and it's going to be plugged back at around nine and it's going to start to increase again. Um, and at the bottom here, uh, we have uh, uh, a Boolean values that shows if the vehicle is connected or not. So that's pretty much how we uh, how a charge plan look like. So the uniqueness of our solutions uh, solution versus others, uh, it's uh, it's it's quite different than your typical uh, load sharing solution. <clears throat> uh, first, we predicts other loads and plans the charging profiles accordingly. Uh, we consider past maximum power demand values uh, to increase power without increasing cost. Uh, like I said before, uh, creating these uh, these energy pockets that we can reuse. Uh, it, retrie it retrieves the state of charge of the vehicle. Uh, it integrates a vehicle calendar, so we know when the vehicle is going to plug in and what distance it's going to travel for each trip. Uh, the solution is pretty much EVSC agnostic, so it's possible to work with different manufacturers. We have a real-time feedback on the meter, so we can compensate for uh, uh, poor estimation or uh, supplemental loads uh, on the network. Uh, it reduces energy drawn on Hydro-Quebec's demand response event, and it uses linear optimization techniques for optimal solutions. So what are the lessons uh, learned so far? Uh, we had and uh, we, we still have a lot of problem at each and every data interface. Uh, so the communication channels are very hard to get up and running. Uh, so the aggregation of information from the multiple sources is very complicated. Um, although the technology is available and seems pretty simple, uh, it's not completely mature. Uh, sometimes manufacturer will have shiny brochures, but uh, I suggest that you, you have to see it to believe it. Um, getting all stars aligned to uh, put the system in production it is almost impossible. We've been trying to get all the systems up and running for quite some times now. Uh, well, of course, we had the COVID-19 that didn't help, but uh, uh, it's, it's quite complicated to, to get all of the system running at the same time. Also, uh, we, in all projects like this, we, you want to make sure that uh, your partners have incentives uh, we brought uh, external actors late in the project and they did not have uh, a lot of incentives to work toward the common goal and it was uh, very hard to get them on board. So uh, what's next? Um, of course, the activation. Um, it should be possible to activate the, the, the project uh, by the end of the summer. The goal is to have uh, the system on, up and running for um, the next school year. Um, whenever the system is activated, we have metrics that are being saved in the cloud and presented uh, through dashboards. Uh, so this will allow us to diagnose uh, errors and tweak the system. Um, so we want to make everything more robust and more mature, of course. Uh, but for, for the future improvements, um, 
um, it would be great to do some of the stuff that's listed here. For example, uh, transfer the charge plan administration to the AVSC. Uh, so whenever a charge plan is produced, we could send it to the AVSC and have the AVSC administer it. So if there's a communication challenge between the back end and the, the charging station, then the charging station can keep on administering the plan. It would be great to auto match a vehicle to any EVSC. For now, uh, each vehicle has an assigned EVSC. Uh, getting rid of all of the unnecessary communication channel would be great too, because of what I said earlier. Uh, we think that we could do it with the fleet management dependency. Uh, we could have uh, OBD2 Wi Fi dongles uh, instead of uh, relying on a uh, cellular modem because we don't really need to have the state of uh, charge of the vehicle while it's uh, out on the road. Uh, we would like to improve the feedback to the end user. Um, it would be great also to account for local power production, such as solar. And it would also be uh, great to have, uh, to allow priority charging on a per vehicle basis. So I hope you found the project interesting. Uh, keep in mind that the system still needs to be activated and that a lot of what I showed you could change in, in the future. Uh, I invite you to follow us on social networks or to subscribe to our newsletter. And finally, I want to make, uh, I will make sure with Miriam that my presentation is made available on the webinar website. Uh, I had to strip quite a bit of content to get um, to, fifth, uh, to 35 minutes, uh, but I will post the full presentation with a bunch of uh, bonus slides. So feel free to take a look. Uh, also feel free to contact me or I guess Jean-Pierre or Jean-Luc for that matter uh, for questions uh, or collaboration opportunities for the future. Thank you. And back to you, Miriam, I guess. Thank you so much, Guillaume. Uh, I remember you mentioned this work was going to be presented at uh, EVS. Uh, I'm assuming uh, you're going to postpone this and the work uh, condensed in a paper is not going to be available soon? Uh, the, the paper is, uh, is out. It's being, it's been, it has been reviewed and it's going to uh, get published in the following weeks. Uh, however, I'm not going to propose because I'm not going to present at EVS 33 because uh, it has been canceled. Uh, and, I'm, and I've decided not to uh, uh, present to uh, EVS 34 as of now. I just want to make sure that we get data if, uh, uh, if I go to present. But the paper is going, is going to be online. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the last, uh, at, uh, and meanwhile, if the participants have questions, please do leave them in the chat, the chat box and we'll read them out. You mentioned that this hasn't been activated yet. Can you uh, remind me what you mean by that? So what I mean is that uh, we, we did all the work to, um, to create the optimizer, to uh, create all the bridges so we get all the information. The system is, is ready. Uh, but the operator, uh, Autobus Laval, is, is operating its school buses uh, right now. Um, and we want to make sure that whenever we, we hit the start button on this, that um, th we're not going to have uh, any problems. So uh, we're trying to, uh, we were trying to get all the, the, the remaining problems ironed out. Uh, and then uh, COVID-19 came up and <laughs> we had to postpone um, the, the activation. But we are planning to uh, activate the system um, by the end of the summer. Okay. Uh, would you mind going to the slide where you show the uniqueness of the system? Yep, no problem. Um, thank you. Let me see. Okay. Uh, so with the linear optimization uh, for the optimal solutions, that would be easy to uh, expand on it. Let's say if you have P photovoltaics on site so you can take into account solar. Yes, exactly. Um, the way we would do it, I think, with, uh, with the local production, um, because it's, it's, hard, it's hard to, um, to uh, broadcast or to forecast, sorry, uh, how much energy you're going to have. 
Um, so we would probably do a control loop like we are, we are doing on the building. Um, you know how the building, we, we're not absolutely sure how much power is going to be consumed. So what we do is we read the meter and by looking at the meter and the target that the optimizer gave us, uh, we, we do a, a control loop on that to bring the value, the, the reading that we have to the, expect, to the, the, the value that, gives the, that is given by the optimizer. So, so we would probably do something similar with locals uh, production because it's really hard to forecast. Okay, I'm going to start to take some questions from uh, the participants. Uh, one of them is, uh, did you consider using the fully charged buses to back feed so vehicle to grid during the peaks caused by the block heater and do you uh, have technology to do that we we uh, started the project with uh, uh, the lion electric company uh, regarding uh, v2g uh, however it was put on hold um, but the the goal was not uh, specifically to integrate uh, these uh, capabilities to this project uh, we wanted to have like a, a, a one shot, easy shot at the beginning, and then we will be able to, uh, you know, put more uh, stuff in it. Uh, but it's a, it's a great suggestion. Uh, of course, it would be uh, very interesting to do that with the vehicles. Well, definitely, I am, I am aware that uh, Nuve uh, have a bus project and they're using them for V2G, so maybe it's worth uh, connecting with them, exchanging notes, because mm -hmm. you, the specific hardware I suppose to be able to backfeed yes uh, what we were try what we were looking at is to have an EVSC with an inverter uh, a grid tie inverter um, so um, yeah you need a special uh, level to uh, the charging station to do that uh, another one is have you added uh, where is it have you added any real-time feedback for control to account for the inaccuracy in your forecast? And before you take that, um, Ted from Nuve uh, just sent you his email if you're interested to contact him regarding the V2G bus project. Great. Uh, so to answer the question, um, yes, as I was saying, we have real-time feedback on the meter. So uh, we're using the meter and we're comparing the meter reading uh, to the the target that the optimizer is giving. And we're trying to reach this target by changing or distributing power uh, to the, the buses. So yes. So you've added real-time feedback for control to account for the in inaccuracy. And was, it, was there a lot of inaccuracy? I don't know because uh, the system yes. is not active oh, yet. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, what is the expected cost saving for the operator with the system? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and this is a question from an, a bus operator. So how yeah. interesting for them? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, what we've seen with Autobus Laval uh, is, uh, and I can't remember the, the numbers, maybe uh, Jean-Luc will remember, but they had an impact uh, of a few thousand dollars uh, for uh, whenever they were uh, uh, increasing their peak by 50%. Jean-Luc, can you uh, step in? Oh, make sure you're not on, uh, Jean-Pierre is not on mute and Jean-Luc might be. Uh, it's uh, Jean-Pierre, if I remember correctly, uh, the bus Laval is something like a, Fourteen dollars per kilowatt. So if um, if if uh, suppose they increase their overall power draw to about uh, by what about a hundred, let's let's round it out. Yep. Then you would have that fourteen dollars times a hundred on the month that it happens, uh, and then you are going to carry that charge for the following twelve months. Not at a hundred percent. I think it's something around the seventy percent. So basically, if you have a power draw that is so high. From there on, the utility will look at that value as a value that there's a risk you'll be calling again, and the rate will be adjusted accordingly. And you'll always have to be paying for that. 
So one of the key benefits for Autobus Laval and for anyone who is looking at uh, electrification of their buses is to prevent those peaks. Uh, we did look within the optimizer to try to reduce all the time the actual power drop, try to smooth the, the, uh, the, the, the plan consumption through the day to make it as flat as possible, which would be exactly that slide, which would allow you to go and get some extra energy savings. But the biggest saving in this project is not as much in terms of reducing your actual, um, your actual bill, but preventing your bill from exploding for bad, uh, bad charge management. Thank you. Uh, the other question is, um, what, are, what is the main load? Is it the block heaters or the uh, EV charging? Would it have been probably simpler to control the block heaters? Uh, for now, um, if I pull up this slide here, um, the, the block heaters uh, and the EVSCs are pretty much the same. Uh, however, the number of block heaters is going to change in time because the, their operation is going to change. And right now they have seven um, uh, electric buses, but they would like to go to, to have more electric buses. So this is, um, this is bound to change. Right now, they're pretty much the same. And that's the reason why they, they operated like this for quite a while before they had the problem. Uh, they didn't, they had, in fact, they had masking loads. These block heaters were masking their EVSCs loads. So um, their, their, their buses. Uh, so they, for quite some time, they did not uh, add any impact on charging the, the, the buses. But at some point uh, they did a mistake where they activated the block heaters at night and then they had this power peak. But the goal of the project is not just to work with Autobus Laval, is to work with uh, all kinds of customers. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I realize that we're after five, but I'm wondering if you have uh, a bit more time because there are more questions. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Excellent. So you mentioned that the EVSC is agnostic. So the charging station is agnostic to, the, to your control uh, strategy? Yes. So how, uh, what's, uh, what's the communication protocol used or did you develop your own? What makes it agnostic? The reason I'm saying it's agnostic is because we have a bridge here and this bridge can communicate with uh, any uh, manufacturer that has an API. So we have, a, it's like a translation layer between the, uh, the API of the manufacturer and our internals, uh, internal processes. So we already have an EVSC that can support uh, um, Tesla uh, wall charger, chargers. Uh, they have um, an RS, uh, like a serial connection to, to them. So we, we designed uh, uh, the bridge so it can also handle uh, Tesla wall connectors. Uh, but uh, we also have, uh, for now, uh, Add Energy. Uh, we're also connecting to Add Energy backend. So as soon as um, uh, a manufacturer has an API and it's accessible to control the power being proposed to their EVSC, uh, we can change the code or add to this bridge here to uh, make it uh, agnostic to the system. You might have mentioned at the beginning, but what is the power, what is the, how big are the batteries on these buses and the power capacity of the chargers? Uh, for now, uh, each and every bus has a 100, uh, 100 kilowatt hour battery. Yeah. And they're using level two uh, charging station um, at 80 amps. So uh, since we're running on a 208 volt circuit, uh, that's around 16.6 .6 kilowatt. So how, um, okay, not super fast, but I suppose overnight charging should be okay. Yes, as I showed uh, on, on one of the slides, um, the, by midnight, uh, most of the, of the vehicles are, are charged. Yeah. Uh, do you use OCPP? For now, we're not using OCPP. Okay. But and we could. Yeah. Uh, because you, you, what you mentioned about the, the bridge and the translator. Yes. 
And uh, the 4G connectivity, I suppose you cannot know now how reliable it, this is until you start doing this. Uh, we already have uh, quite uh, an insight because um, the system is is uh, is is up. It's running. It's we we've just blocked uh, here, uh, so all all of the system is running. Uh, but we we just uh, put the system so that it, it provides always ADMs. So um, so we know that this is it is pretty uh, sturdy. Uh, for example, this uh, uh, 4G 4G link here is much more steady than the Zigbee here. Um, and uh, for the fleet management, we we didn't have any problem regarding this channel here. The problem is more uh, getting the information uh, from the CAN bus, uh, translate it, uh, send it to the back end, and then push it to, to our system and having all of these little things work at the same time for all of the different interfaces. Okay, um, I got a question about if uh, you push from 60 kilo, 16 kilowatt to 50 kilowatt, would that impact your optimization solution? Um, I don't think so. Uh, it's not something we envisage, but you could have uh, EVSCs that are much more powerful and it's only a matter of uh, changing the, um, the constraints on the first stage. Would it still be uh, effective, the optimization solution? That's um, it. it could, because it's only a maximum power value. So it, it doesn't matter if you have a 100 kilowatt uh, charging station or a 16 kilowatt uh, charging station, because you're controlling it. So having the ability to go higher than 16 uh, could be great, but it might not be needed in all uh, circumstances. Yeah. Okay. To segue back to the, uh, to the grid aspect in Hydro-Quebec, we had a question about grid content. Well, in, uh, in Quebec, you have, it's all hydropower, correct? So you really don't worry about the, gr the grid carbon content. Uh, that is correct. We're uh, above Good 99 percent <laughs> renewable. We, yeah. we do have some. Uh, we call them off-grid power stations. When you get to uh, the the really northern areas of Quebec, where the uh, the main grid does not reach, we do have some thermal power stations in those areas. But slowly through the years, we've been working at uh, integrating. Uh, uh, renewable energy uh, systems there as well. We have uh, solar panels. In, uh, in the coming years, we have one big area, which is called uh, Ile de la Madeleine, Magdalene's Islands, which is in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of well, not the ocean, but the, the Gulf uh, de Saint Laurent. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna connect them to the mainland. So slowly we're go, going to all of those areas and try to make smaller improvements to, to try to get rid as much as we can of uh, thermal power stations. Excellent. And um, what is the main issue of the grid in Quebec? So, for example, in the UK, we're trying to avoid uh, increasing the already existing peak demand by avoiding electric vehicles charging between, let's say, 4 and 7 p.m. Uh, because then our grid is unlikely to take this extra load. What is your issue in Quebec? You already have electric heating, so I'm assuming your grid is already robust. Our, our grid is already extremely robust. We, we face similar issues as the one uh, you just mentioned, so we're looking at what the impact of EVs is going to be. But at large, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little hard-pressed, uh, not being specifically from that team, to know what exactly is the biggest challenge that we have. I don't know, Jean-Luc, if you're still on the line, if you want to chime in. But in fact, we, yes, uh, we had a, a big issue. It was a, a icy storm and uh, we had a big blackout. So it's now more than uh, 20, 25 uh, years ago. So it was our main issue. Okay. But right now we, we did uh, what was mean, needed to, to be done. Your main, issue was, your main issue was a problem that happened 25 years ago. Yeah, it was a nice so, system, a lot of ice. Okay. So it, yes, it, yes. Happened, it happened again this year. So it's a good point that you bring. I would say what's probably the biggest challenge that we have is the extent of the power lines that we have. So the issue that Jean-Luc is bringing up is 
we had an ice storm uh, almost 25 years ago that hit the transmission lines uh, coming from up north. So a whole set of pylons just just crushed under the weight of the ice. So for a few weeks, we had power out in some areas of Quebec. We had a similar situation in terms of impact uh, earlier uh, in the last 12 months. I think it was at the end of last year where we had a, a, a wind a wind tempest and it just it was a distribution network that was affected. So I would probably say that the biggest challenge that we have is just there's just so many kilometers of line in every single one is important. So do you, do you look at distribution? Do you look at transmission? You got to make everything as sturdy and dependable as you can. And sometimes have plan B's, plan C's and more. So yeah. that's probably our biggest challenge. Interesting. So, we so, far, have, uh, so yeah, you have a different issue. So while here we might want to use those batteries on wheel to help reduce the peak or shift the peak, maybe in, in Quebec you want to use those cars as a support in case there's a blackout to find a way to use the, these uh, energy resources to help make the grid more robust or to get back power to some areas of the network. Well, let's agree to, to, to have a talk again in a few years and see where we're at with that. Good. Because that is obviously one of the points that we're working on. Excellent. Okay. Uh, one last question uh, from my side. Uh, you mentioned that um, Quebec is, is massive. And, uh, and, and, and I had a chance to actually feel how big it is when we drove for seven hours and we looked at the map and it was nothing. So how are you going to manage to put the charging stations there to make sure long distance travel in Quebec is possible? Who's going to pay for it? So this is what I try to, to present. We, we are paying for it. So, uh, but thanks to this charging station, we are selling more electricity. So that means that in fact, quite yeah. nobody is paying for it. So we have a, a good uh, business case. Okay, and again, in your case, different than other countries, it makes sense for you, Hydro-Quebec, the electric utility, to install these charging stations and to run them because uh, you, can, you can sell the electricity directly. Yes, yes. The and regulation, also, yeah, yeah, the regulation in Quebec is different than other countries. Yes. Where yes. Yeah, okay, great. Exactly. great. We have some, there, there are some of the small networks. So for, for example, Petro-Canada, they have some uh, fast charging station, but they are not so much. Uh, there's also another network flow on, on small network of charging station, but uh, we are the main one and, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and it's really robust. And I think we have a, the, it's a very good way to, to, do, to do it. You, uh, you touched this uh, initially, but you said that the harsh weather in Quebec is not impacting the usage of electric vehicles? No, no, uh, for sure it, it has some impact on the range, but uh, thanks to our networks, the, the people, they can, they can uh, do what they want to do. But uh, at the same time, you know, during the winter, the people, they, 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 they drive less than during the summer. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. okay, but uh, no, we have really no problem. There's no problem to start the vehicle during the winter. They, no, no, really. Okay. It's, uh, yeah. The people have are there been really, any... uh, Sorry, go on. No, no, we have really we have no problem with uh, with the winter. For Is example, there... if the people they pre eat their their cars, so uh, the range is is uh, reducing but not so much if you pray eat the cars uh, during in the morning uh, so there are some mitigation to to, to this uh, yeah to this uh, to this and has there been any collection of data on battery degradation from the impact of potentially harsh weather uh, maybe guillaume uh, do you want to you did some uh, you did some tests for theo taxi Yes, uh, unfortunately, I do, I do not have the information, but IVI did work on some projects uh, like this. Uh, I was not the project manager on this, so I'm not going to be able to answer. That's fine. Okay. Uh, to, um, uh, to conclude, if we wanted more information on the smart uh, charging bus project, we can contact Guillaume. For Hydro-Quebec projects, where is the best way to find more information? On our website. Okay. 
and separate. But uh, you know, the, the cold weather is much more better for a, for the battery than uh, than hot weather, hot, hot climate. So, for example, California and Freud, uh, they are, the car here, they have some degradation of battery here in Quebec. We prefer the winter for the battery. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay. Well, Jean-Luc, Jean-Pierre and Guillaume, merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Bye.